Uh, anytime, again, you have some, some kind of uncertainty, particularly if this country is talking about military strikes, it's possible that this could alienate some of the uh, Arab countries, oil supplying Arab countries, and they may restrict some supplies in order to placate uh, some of the uh, people in their own country who are going to be up upset with, uh, with our military maneuvers. So again, anytime there's any kind of uncertainty, you're going to have a spike up in prices. All right. It is uh, 1230 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time on what has now become a Monday morning here on the East Coast. Let's uh, swing over to Gary Gutley and get an uh, up-to-minute report on the latest news developments. Gary? Uh, thank you, Jack. Well, as we know, we go downtown and can look at the scene in lower Manhattan here. Uh, as we can see here, the rescue efforts are continuing. There is still some of that smoke uh, rising, little fires breaking out here and there. This is a live shot. Uh, so far, the death toll unfortunately remains steady at 190 confirmed dead. Another 4,957 are missing under the rubble there. Earlier today, we got a bird's eye look at the ground zero damage in Manhattan. We're seeing that now from the air. This uh, is the site of the World Trade Center towers, 110 stories tall, once upon a time until last Tuesday. And over the weekend, the long, painful, and yes, inescapable process of healing continued across the nation. The sound of singing was heard here at this prayer service in Omaha, Nebraska. But then there's also the other business of the nation, business itself. Wall Street will be back at work tomorrow buying and selling shares, buying and selling stakes in the American economy. And looking ahead to the business day, Wall Street says it is ready to go. Oh, okay. We are ready to go, 9.30 tomorrow morning, and the best way of communicating to these criminals that they've been unsuccessful is for us to ring that bell and be back in business, and we intend to do that. And air traffic across the country resumed over the weekend. This is New York's LaGuardia Airport. Newark and JFK are also back in business, but Washington's Reagan National uh, remains closed down until further notice. And across the country, the manhunt continues. The FBI is out there, as you see. Two more arrest warrants were issued for material witnesses. The details of those orders are sealed. In Delray Beach, Florida there, FBI investigators searched an apartment building for more clues. At least one terrorist suspect lived inside this complex there in Florida. Those men are believed to be connected with the man President Bush is calling the prime suspect. But Osama bin Laden issued a statement Sunday denying once again that he had any role in Tuesday's attacks. He says he's been living quietly in Afghanistan and following its leaders' rules and laws in that country. Meanwhile, though, and this is an important development, the Pakistani government is sending an official to Afghanistan to Kabul Monday to ask or rather to tell the Taliban to hand over bin Laden within three days or else. What is the or else? Well, or else they may face military action from the United States. And that's a look there along the Afghan-Pakistani uh, border, a very important crossing point. Um, Jack, uh, just as we throw it back to you right now, I was down on Wall Street today and uh, doing some research, and I came across an interesting fact that maybe you know it. I don't want to throw a quiz at you, but perhaps the viewers might be interested in this question. What and uh, where and when and what was the first major terrorist attack in the United States? Any idea? I have no idea at all. Well, here it is. Listen to this. It was 1920, and where was it? on Wall Street, wow. right across the, uh, the uh, New York Stock Exchange, right next to the place where George Washington was sworn in as our first president. Anarchists set off a bomb there next uh, to those uh, financial sites. They were angry at capitalism. 33 people were killed and hundreds were issued. 1920, Wall Street has always been vulnerable. Well, that's something. I'm, some things never change. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gary. Gary Cutley with the latest news. Mark in Texas, welcome to the program. What can we do for you? Uh, yes, hi. How are you this evening? Good. Good. My question is, um, let me turn down the TV. Yeah, my I was going to say, is, I can hear you. You have to turn it down. Okay. There my question is, we um, woke up to a global community this last Tuesday with a resounding blow. And we're going to spend a great deal of money, which we need to, on our safety uh, of our country and human intel and all of that. Could we not do a program for the next 50 years to get Muslim and global dollars into these moderate, uh, impoverished countries to show them uh, some capitalism and democracy? And, you know, we're only 200 years old, and we're pretty awesome. I was wondering well, we, if we could do some kind of global community thing to get these things built up. Uh, we touched on that uh, a bit earlier in the broadcast. Um, Mansouri Jaz is uh, of Pakistani descent. He's a Muslim. And we were talking about 
uh, the fact that uh, the, the hatred, the intense white-hot hatred of the United States, uh, at least in part, is rooted in the extreme poverty in that part of the world and the tremendous contrast that exists between the standard of living there and the standard of living here. Uh, the other side of that coin is using the desperate economic conditions as a weapon and, uh, and clamping down economically on the countries and states that support terrorism and cutting off uh, the inflow of goods, uh, not buying the exports. Uh, what about economic warfare as opposed to traditional military warfare? The, the, the problem is that it has been shown over and over again that economic sanctions do nothing more than cause more of these problems to come up because whether we like it or not, we live in a world of very unscrupulous souls. And those people are willing to sell arms to uh, Afghanistan, to Pakistan, to any other country that has a military embargo placed against it. And the caller raises an interesting point, but I think there, again, there needs to be a perspective put on that. And that is that uh, one of the reasons that somebody like Osama bin Laden, and a again, this is in no defense of him, but I want to I want to make no. sure that people here understand what is his complaint sure. on well, the that's, other side I mean, of the fence. We need to understand that too. And, uh, and I think one of the one of the things that he has said very often is that if you go into a structure like the Saudi royal family where they concentrate wealth in one part and they decide who they want to give that wealth to, that causes a disparity within, within a society which we do not control from right. the outside. Right. Yet we are seen because we want to deal with a society uh, from an oil management standpoint, from the standpoint of keeping oil prices low, that has one decision maker. That's why democracy in some of these oil-related countries has never been a great priority of ours. We would love to tell the Sudan that they need to be democratic, but right across the Red Sea, we right. don't tell Saudi Arabia that they need to do it. No, no. So I think that in that sense, for now decades, there has been an enormous hypocrisy in American foreign policy that needs to be corrected. But having said that, that doesn't make it right that when people think that the only way that they can rectify their wrong is to come in kill innocent people. That's just, that's unacceptable. So we are going to root these people out and we have to do that. But once we do it, we then have to be also responsible enough to take some of the money that we have and more equitably distribute it and help these societies build their democratic frameworks up. Fair enough. Brian. And their economic yeah. structures as well, which I think gets to an issue that um, has been an important one over the last year or so, which is this whole issue of globalization. Mm -hmm. And I think it's been, I've just tried to sit back and think about some of these issues and said, why has there been so much turmoil in Genoa and Vancouver and you right, know, Seattle every time and all these, these things? Industrialized when, nations when it, get together. Yeah. When in fact, you know, for the most part, the world has been at peace and the world's economies have been pretty good. And it's because, in essence, there hasn't been something to coalesce people, a, a bigger and stronger issue. But in fact, you know, the globalization ultimately is, has the opportunity of bringing better economics, capitalism, and ultimately democracy to these poorer nations. And so that is a benefit of globalization. It may benefit also capitalist com uh, companies in the Western world, but in fact, by putting your plants there and by building facilities there, you're bringing those people to jobs that would never have had jobs before. Let me get to a call. Brian in Wisconsin, uh, you're on the air with us. What can we help you with? Uh, yes, sir. I'm just uh, wondering if your panelists might be able to answer a question on what effect military action might have upon the economy. That is to say, uh, regardless of what type it is, boots, bullets, and beans do cost money, and they have to come from somewhere. What effect, as we saw in World War II, with massive spending, somewhat bailing out the economy. What effect might that have right now in the long term on the economy? Larry Elder, let's uh, let you take a shot at that. Are you there? Well, uh, sure, I'm here. Uh, could I address a little bit, though, of what we said just a moment ago sure. about uh, money to, uh, to, to some of these countries to bail them out? One of the reasons that America uh, is disliked by so many people in the world, especially in the Arab world, is the feeling that we've interfered in the domestic policies of so many other countries. When you look at the trillions of dollars that we've given to aid around the world, especially to third world countries, it hasn't done very much good. In fact, we've often propped up regimes that are military juntas or totalitarian dictatorships, when in fact what people need uh, is free property, uh, 
uh, uh, capitalism, the rule of law, the kinds of things that have made this country great. Uh, this country is a young country. Persia is substantially older than we are. A lot of Arab countries are older than we are. Why is it we're doing better than they are? The answer is not that we cheated. The answer is not that we're brutal or unfair or amoral. The answer is that people are free. We, uh, we worship free markets. We worship uh, private property and the rule of law. Those are the kinds of qualities and conditions that create prosperity. And so if we have an international United Nations Commission on, on racism, let's have one on why countries are wealthy and why countries are poor. And you found out that it has nothing to do with religion and everything to do with free market, free enterprise, uh, and the rule of law and the respect for private property. All right. Yes, no now, one. the callers, let me, get, let me get you to answer the callers' question, though, which is what kind of economic impact domestically might the buildup and eventual prosecution of a war against terrorism have on our economy at home? Well, I think in the short run, it'll, uh, it'll help. Uh, any kind of uh, public spending like that in, in the short run will help. But in the long run, any time the public sector spends money and takes money out of the economy, uh, it hurts things. Uh, we do need to spend far, money, uh, far more money on our military, uh, but we are overcommitted. Uh, we are in 100 countries around the world where we often have no national security interests. We never should have gone, in my opinion, to Bosnia and Somalia and, uh, and Kosovo uh, and Haiti. Uh, these are not our problems. We ought to be spending money to support uh, America and to defend America. Americans. And we should spend less money on government programs, on uh, welfare entitlements for the able-bodied. Uh, and we should marshal our resources for the number one responsibility of the government, and that's to protect people and property. CNN correspondent Major Garrett's at the White House in Washington tonight, where uh, the uh, difference of opinion on uh, additional defense spending evaporated with uh, the crumbling of the Twin Towers on sure Tuesday. Uh, the Congress uh, passed a $40 billion resolution uh, either that day or the next, and, uh, and in effect have said uh, we're ready to spend whatever it takes to get this done. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of things, of course, change, Jack, not individually the defense budget, the entire debate around it. You mentioned that $40 billion, $20 billion is set aside for rescue, recovery, cleanup efforts in New York, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Another $20 billion for counterterrorism activities. A lot of things will come in under that umbrella. And one other thing changed considerably on Tuesday. Before Tuesday, there was great debate in Washington about defense restructuring, trying to recreate the Pentagon, recreate all four of the military services to try to make them more mobile, to make them more adaptive to a new environment. Well, that hadn't taken place before this first war of the 21st century, as the president has called it, was already waged. And so that kind of reassessment is almost happening on the fly right now. And it is quite clear that as this campaign goes forward in whatever dimension it takes, there will be likely more requests of Congress for aid to the Pentagon. You can be pretty well confident that those requests, by and large, will be approved and be approved rapidly. So there was thinking before Tuesday about how to readjust and how to reshape the American military to respond to different non-conventional types of warfare. That reassessment has been accelerated dramatically. Dollars will follow. All right, Major, thank you. Major Garrett at the White House. Chris in Missouri, you're on the air with us. Uh, what kind of week have you had? Well, first of all, I just wanted to say um, my deepest regrets to the families that lost their lives in, in New York. Um, but I have a question in a sense to, um, to our president. Um, it's kind of weird to me that over here in the United States we have terrorists, you know, like Timothy McVeigh, um, who did that horrible thing in Oklahoma. And I just want to know, basically, what are we going to do in the United States to help change some of the attitudes and some of the racist things that's going on here in our society before we can go over there? Well, you know, that's uh, obviously a, a very big piece of all of this. It's not, you know, it's not Arabs against uh, Caucasians, the Middle East against the United States. We have a whole basket of those kinds of problems here in, in our own country. Uh, Mansouri Jazz, uh, have you heard or witnessed any kind of uh, backlash activity. I, I was telling a story last night. There's a little donut shop in my hometown. Uh, I live in New Jersey, about 15 miles from here. And uh, kids who look like they are of Arab descent work behind the counter in there. The day this happened, they ha the police pulled into the parking lot and shut the place down. Uh, the rumor going through town was that these kids were Islamic fundamentalists and that they began celebrating and writing anti-American slogans on the window. And the police went in and said, you've got to get out of here for your own safety. A couple of days went by. The store never reopened. The cops were there around the clock. Saturday, I went into the parking lot and got out and went over to the cop. And I said, what happened here? Turns out these kids are not Islamic fundamentalists at all. They're Indian. 
They did nothing wrong, but within an hour of the explosions at the World Trade Center, 150 threats by telephone went into this little donut store in a town of 15,000 people in New Jersey. So the caller who's raising the issue of the racial profiling and the, and the stereotyping and the potential backlash in this country has a valid point. Uh, how do we guard against that? It happened to the Japanese after Pearl Harbor was bombed. Well, the first thing that we have to realize is that we're all Americans, and we're all in this together. I agreed very much with the caller who previously said, why don't we call ourselves American Arabs and right. American Pakistanis and so forth. We are Americans first. 